I'm wearing eight. Cool. He's wearing eight devices right now. Yes. Welcome, Professor Christoph Koch, President and Chief Scientific Officer of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Thank you. I'm only wearing one wearable device. And, and furthermore, we are, we, we are not into the business of making wearable devices at the Allen Institute. I'm not quite sh sure why I'm here, except that Lisa was very insistent, and, and, uh, and so here I am. So um, we are Basic Neuroscience Institute. Thank you. We are Basic Neuroscience Institute up in, um, up in Seattle. Uh, so we're an independent, uh, non-for-profit. We started in 2003, so we're uh, 16 years old. We're roughly 330 people at the, at the institute that I lead, and we're a culture somewhere be uh, between a university and a tech. We're a university in the sense that we do basic uh, research, and everything we do we put out um, freely, publicly, uh, worldwide. Uh, but we are like a tech in the sense we have smart goals, we have deliverables, we have program management, um, uh, etc. And we're not a PI-driven institution, so we pursue a few large projects and then execute them. So we're not trying to compete with the Stanfords or the UWs of the world, but we're trying to do things that, that can't be done in a university uh, context and that industry um, um, isn't interested in. We've now sort of uh, increasingly, as we move towards human neuroscience, as you'll see, we're thinking more about sort of um, uh, of liaison with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with biotech or with pharma to try to see whether some of these insights can ultimately release and um, um, uh, end up in, um, in therapies by partnering with an appropriate partner. Um, so when, when, when I, I was 27 years at Caltech and then I came there, we started end up, uh, with uh, Paul's Blessing, a 10-year program roughly for, five, for this amount of people, for a billion dollars, trying to do two things, to build uh, uh, observatories where we can observe the activity of 100,000 cells in a mouse um, in, in real time. So we, we're doing that. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Today, I'll talk about the other large-scale project, which is to build a complete census of all the types of brain cells in a mouse and in, in a human. This is our budget. And of course, we're all funded by the ingenuity of Paul Allen, who, as you probably know, uh, recently passed, um, passed away. But he's provided for us, so we are uh, here for the long term. So as I said, we're doing all these, uh, these large-scale data resources that some of you will, will, uh, will know. Everything we do is based on cells. So we are focusing on cells. Right? The, if you want to understand perception or uh, consciousness or memory and its pathologies, you really need to go to the level of, underlying, of, of the underlying neurons or, 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 or brain cells. So that's what we're doing. Um, we're not using any bulk tissues, uh, um, uh, technologies like MEG, EEG, fMRI, PET, etc. Um, we study two species, the, the human brain and the mouse brains, almost exactly a factor 1,000 different in terms of cell counts, in terms of surface area or mass of the brain, roughly 86 billion versus 70 billion, uh, million in the, in, the, in the mouse. And what we see, I'll tell you a little bit more, we see huge diversity in any one cortical region, we see on the order of 100 different types of cells. Cells as defined by their morphology, as defined by their tricks, transcriptome, as defined by their, uh, by their electrical properties. And we now, we, we are interested in pursuing the hypothesis that many neurological and psychiatric diseases like ALS, like, like Parkinson's, um, like Huntington's, uh, like certain types of epileptic seizures are really pathologies of individual cell types. So it's not just a generic degeneration of the brain, but it's really, or at least it starts in very specific types of cells that are characterized, for instance, by their transcriptomes, and from there it spreads. Or in some cases we know, for example, in the retina, the certain, uh, certain types of pathologies are not only due to pathologies in individual cell types, but in particular synaptic connections among two identified cell types. So it's very, it's, it's, um, it's very specific. There are five ways to get at the human brain. If you're interested in the, in the human brain, like I think all of us here, the, the one way you access it from the outside, so you do fMRI or EG or, or any other technology that allows you to, to remain, to not penetrate uh, the skull, because that's, of course, a huge barrier, and you're non, never going to get normal people to, uh, uh, to agree to have, well, there are very few people way out on the risk that they're willing to have uh, a holes drilled in their head, but that's obviously not... Uh, for most of us. So the typical route, how brains have been studied at the cellular level for roughly 200 years is, of course, dead brains, post-mortem brains. You can learn a lot there about the structure of the brain, but of course, very little about the function of the brain. You can look at, um, uh, in fetal tissue, 
uh, which is fantastic. It's, it's, it's real brain, but it's very young. Typically, it's first trimester, so the brain is, is sort of uh, is barely developed and remains um, highly controversial, of course, in this country with uh, access in, uh, more and more um, restricted. You can do neurosurgical samples, which is what we are doing. So it's a re reliable routine source, as I'll show you, of, um, of, uh, surgical uh, of human tissue that until 20 minutes ago was part of your brain, except you have the unfortunate uh, fact that you also have a deep tissue tumor, let's say, in the hippocampus, or you have an epileptic foci in your hippocampus or in your amygdala or in another deep brain structure. And so the, t the surgeon to access that tumor, that epileptic seizure, has to tunnel through the overlying, let's say, middle temple gyrus, tunnel through, excise that piece of tissue, drop it in a, in a, in a special container, and then within 20 minutes, it, it's in our lab. Or sometimes we do, uh, in the OR, we, are, we already do fixating um, of the tissue for certain purposes. And of course, the, the last very exciting right now, but still very much in its infancy, is induced with pluripotent stem cell. Fantastic uh, promise, but right now the neurons or the, the brain organoids or spheroids or whatever you call it are still very, very far away from mature neurons. So we're choosing, we're focused on the, on the upper two techniques. We have this entire battery now where we, so, so of, the, of our 330 people, roughly probably 250 are working on mouse. And of course, mouse neuroscience is incredibly mature, right? You can identify, you can turn neurons or groups of neurons on or off with millisecond precision over, over hours or, or even days. You can study them in great detail. We can do whole brain reconstruction where we take a single axon in a brain that fits comfortably into a sugar cube and we can trace 20 centimeters of its axon. Now in humans, we, we, there, there, there are, of course, severe restrictions where what you can do in a human brain, but still the, the technologies are advancing very rapidly, so we can now routinely do human single-cell nuclear transcriptomics. We do nuclear uh, single-cell RNA-seq rather than cellular RNA-seq, since uh, human tissue very often comes from people who are 30, 40, 50, 60 year old. Unlike fresh mouse tissue that's six weeks old, you can't really dissociate the cells very well. So, you, so that's why we prefer to do uh, uh, nuclear. You can do great electrophysiological recordings where you can actually record in a slice for days at an end living brain tissue. As I said that 20 minutes ago, where we're in your brain, we can do full EM reconstruction. So we're now reconstructing a cubic millimeter of human or three cubic millimeter of human tissue at the gold, at the, um, at the electromicroscopic uh, um, level, and we're beginning to record. We, we helped develop this fantastic technology called neural pixel recording. With a single piece of machine silicon, you have 964 electrodes, and you have four wires, four wires going out, and you can record now typically from a thousand cell with 30 kilohertz precision. It is, of course, invasive, so it works great in animals. In human, uh, we, we're now trying to see whether we can introduce it in, in, a, in a neurosurgical context. And then we're also developing human uh, viral genetic te um, uh, techniques, as you know, in, uh, in, again, in animals, particularly in mammals like, uh, like the, the mouse. We have fantastic tools to transport and retrograde transport and, and bring all sorts of uh, uh, vectors into cells. We develop these now in humans because we have these very stable cultures that we can get from, from human tissue. And we've adopted some of them using enhancer technology from the mouse that we can then directly test in a human where we get very specific types of neurons that, for example, fluoresce in the human brain now. Uh, so it's a, it's a large project. Like everything we do, it's led in this case by Adeline. As I said, we have a few large projects and pursue, uh, pursue these with, uh, with large teams. So cell types, right? So you probably all know it's a big thing that people are doing now trying to identify all, all the cell types. So we roughly know, well, 400 years ago, people discovered that biological organisms consist of cells. 200 years ago, the cell theory was established, right? All biological organisms consisted of one or more cells. Cells beget, beget other cells. And then 130, 140 years ago, people discovered due to chemical dyes, that there's this great diversity of different neurons in the, in the brain, right? Raymond, Icajal, and Golgi, et cetera, first Nobel Prize. Uh, but now, of course, we're really realizing they're not only brain cells. They're not only excited inhibited brain cells. They're all these different families. And just like you can spa uh, classify species at many, many different levels, you can classify cell types at many, many different levels. The question that we and that everybody is pursuing in the field right now, it's a very large effort across, across the world really, is at the subtype level, at the bottom level here, how many subtypes of cells there are. 
we used to think they were two and three. Theoreticians get by with a single type of neuron, right? You can show McCulloch Pitts, show 1946, one type of, U, of neuron is, uni, is Turing universal. Anything that can be computed can be computable by, let's say, and not gates. The brain is uh, very different. Of course, it has to evolve and it also has to develop. So it looks like in any one area, as I said, I mentioned before, on the order of 100 different cell types that differ in various ways. So what we're doing in a, in a series of papers uh, published in Nature, typically, we, um, what we do, we do this single cell transcriptomics, and then we try to identify how many types of cells there are using a variety of clustering techniques. All right, now the clustering techniques, of course, come with all sorts of problems because it's a, sort of this fight between lumpers and splitters, how many different clusters are there, and people constantly come up with, with more sophisticated techniques. And so the exact number of cell types right now is still very much in flux, and unlike a periodic table, you know, where, where, where we know all natural existing elements fit into one of 92 different buckets, we don't have anything, and we will never have anything like that in biology because biology is, of course, an evolved system, unlike the periodic table, which is, uh, which is due to quantum mechanics, which is not an evolved system. Uh, so here, uh, this came out a couple of months ago, where we do a very detailed deep dive in two areas in the mouse, in, in a visual area and in a motor area. And we do uh, you know, um, very deep sequencing, where this is called SMARTA, where we get typically between eight and 10,000 different genes in each cell. And we get that across, in this case, 25,000 cells. And so now we can do the clustering. The, the basic, really interesting discovery we made is the following, that if you look at two different areas, you look at the inhibitory cell types. There are roughly 50 different inhibitory cell types. You can, of course, ask, why does a brain need 50 different GABAergic cells? The answer is we don't know. Um, it turns out these inhibitory cells in these different brain regions are the same, transcriptional speaking. They're the same. Now, of course, these neurons also don't project outside the particular cortical area. So interneurons, with one exception, remain within their cortical area. And they, they are transcriptional, they're the same. Uh, the excitatory cell types, so if you want to follow this, so here we plot the distribution. So here we, we do the taxonomical tree. These are all the non neurons, these are all the neuronal cells. Here they're, they're two, MIS2 and, and, and Cajal Retio cell. The vast majority of, cell, of neurons are divided into two trees, excitatory and inhibitory one. And here what you can see, the two colors denote whether it comes from the motor area or the visual area. And what you can see that the excitatory cells, with, with uh, two exceptions, are unique to here or unique to here. In other words, the excitatory cells in two different cortical areas are different, transcriptional speaking, while the inhibitory cells are really the same. To me, that makes sense if you think about cell type as having really two components. A cell type A is a component itself, just like you have a transistor. It does a particular computation, but then it needs to send it somewhere. So it needs to carry the zip code of wherever that neuron projects to. And neurons in motor cortex, of course, have to project to different places, like they project to the pons, they project to the spinal cord, while a neuron in visual cortex projects to visual places, like the, like the superior colliculus, right? And so therefore, it makes sense, uh, um, at least to me, although my, my colleagues differ with this interpretation, that these transcriptional are all different because they all go outside the cortex and have to, have to carry information about uh, uh, where they eventually end up, while these neurons all remain local and don't need that long distance zip code. And therefore, transcriptionally, they appear to be similar. All right, so that's in the mouse. And uh, one can go very deep into here. This is a comparative methods paper. So now we're doing the same in, in human. So in human, we're doing either post-mortem. The advantage of post-mortem is, of course, you can sample. You, we, we have a large bank of, of neurotypical uh, brains that, that, didn't, um, that died, that didn't pass away donor brains, that didn't pass away from any neurological or psychiatric disease. And the advantage of that is we can now sample everywhere. The drawback is it's not fresh tissue. So we also uh, we, we do this analysis, and then we do what's called fax, fax seeding, fluorescent uh, uh, sorted, uh, and then RNA seeking, which is exactly the same technique we do in mouse. So we try to do this things as similar as possible between mouse and, and human. And we also add uh, neurosurgical samples here. Right. And so this is a paper that's currently under review where we do something very similar. So here, again, we get typically between eight and 10,000 different genes detected uh, uh, across nucleus. 
Then, of course, so now you're trying to do clustering in these eight or 10,000 dimensional spaces. It's very tricky. It's, uh, so you have to do very different algorithms. We're putting all the data out there, or have put already all the data out there, because different people with a different algorithm will come to slightly different conclusions. But the overall shape is very robust. So this is the, before what I showed you, this taxonomy of two cortical regions in the mouse. Now this is the taxonomy in the human middle temple gyrus. Overall, it's, very, it's remarkable it's similar. We have, an, uh, we have uh, sort of uh, non-neuronal cell types, you know, astroglia and, and uh, endothelial cells, et cetera. And then we have these two very large branches, inhibitory cells and excitatory cell. We also have a cajal Ritchie cell here. And uh, so here we, uh, we have these number of cells. Now, they're not exactly the same as in mouse. But of course, the tissues, we have vastly more tissue in case in, uh, in mouse. In the mouse, because we have different transgenic uh, uh, lines, we can target specific uh, layers or lines that are enriched for particular cell types. We can't do that, obviously, in human. And here we use nuclear RNA versus, uh, versus whole cell um, uh, RNA-seq, so they're not comparable. But we, we, we are very confident that as we sample, and we are doing this right as we speak, as we're sampling more human donors, more diverse, roughly the number of cell types is going to be the same, just like the genes, right? Contrary to lots of prediction in the 80s, the number of genes you have and the number of genes that critters have in the basement of this building is roughly the same. It's on the order of 20,000. And the same thing, if I take a cubic millimeter of your cortex, which contains on the order of 50,000 cells, that cubic millimeter, that quinoa grain, size grain, uh, a piece of brain in a mouse will contain 80,000 cells, but the number of cell types and their rough shape is going to be roughly similar. In fact, we can do this, so we can try to map now in a very quantitative way. We're doing that in, in, in different ways. Here's one way where we map the human, with all the caveats that I mentioned, the human MTG-derived taxonomy for cortex against the mouse V1 and ALM-derived um, category. We're now expanding because we're now doing the entire uh, mouse brain, as we, uh, in the entire mouse cortex, and we're doing six different cortical areas in, in human. But this is just a more limited view. And then you can do clustering, for example. Uh, you can do uh, this, this particular very popular technique now, uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis, where you can cluster in this T-SNE plot. This is a high-dimension uh, nonlinear clustering algorithm. And what you can see, if you look at the human and mouse, look at this. The basic hardware, I mean, this is what I'm saying since 20 years, the basic hardware between us and the mouse is very, very similar. It's not the same. I'll show you that. There are lots of genes that are different, which explains why if you're a drug company and you develop some beautiful targeted receptor against a, a mouse variant of a human disease, it's going to help that mouse, but it won't be very effective for the human. But the basic hardware is, uh, is the same. We're all nature's children, and the, main, the, the big difference between us and mouse is that our brain is a thousand times bigger. All right, so here, here, uh, here we just do it for... For, for GABAergic cells, human and mouse, and you can see, I mean, they're not perfectly aligned, but they're remarkable similar aligned. So here we, we, we do this now, where we do the best sort of uh, uh, comparison between all the different types in the mouse and all the different types in the human. And in certain cases, like here, we have 10 different cases where there's an exact counterpart between a mouse and a human. Although the last common ancestor between mice and human lived, you know, after the, the asteroid came in or I guess before the asteroid came in, uh, 65 million years ago. So that's roughly the last common ancestor between us and mice. But for example, you have these beautiful cells that are much beloved by anatomists called Chandelier cells. They look like, like Chandeliers, you know, like, like, like um, the, 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 the Chandeliers that come down from the ceiling. They're also called axoaxonic. There's one cell type in the mouse, and there's one cell type in the human. There's certain types of long dist of um, of uh, inhibitory uh, cells, that, uh, somatostatin cells, that actually have an axon the rare, that goes outside the, the cortical area, somatostatin shortle cell. There's one type in the mouse and one type in the human and some other cells here. But there are also some cells where, you know, you have, um, um, you, you have um, many different, there's one type in the, in the mouse, but there are different types in, in humans. So it's not identical, it's just overall remarkable similar, with some cell types being conserved. Um, 
Yeah, here, for example, is a particular cell type uh, we, uh, we worked on to together with a group in Hungary. We can do recording from them. This is in layer one. So this is the most superficial cell. So typically, you don't have excitatory cell. It's a beautiful, very specific type of human cell called the, uh, the rose hip cell because the morphology looks somewhat like, like rose hip. But it turns out it's not fully unique. It, so it, it's really tricky now. What do you mean unique, right? When people say, well, this is unique to human. Well, there is a homolog that you can find of these cells um, 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 in, a, in a mouse where you have some conserved marker genes. Same thing, uh, so this is for excitatory neurons, um, um, uh, mouse and human. Here we have interesting, much more diversity in layer 3, 4. So we knew this for, there were other indications for that, that compared to, to mice, our layer, the, the, the middle layers and the upper layers are relatively um, expanded, and, and, and we can see that. So this is interesting. So if we look at these two cell types, the microglia cell, that's the same, transcriptional speaking, this is a, a similar cell type in the mouse and the human, and these Chonelier cells that are similar in the mouse and human, that if you actually look at the log expression level of all the genes, so these are eight or 10,000 genes that we find in this one cell, or in, 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 in many cells of this type. And here's sort of a, 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 a log two number of, uh, you know, of RNA copies that are expressed. And here for, for the human, you can see identical, if they're the same, they would all be along the diagonal. So even if they, they are the same within a factor two, they span here. But even here, you can see many so-called cell type specific marker that still they may differ by factor of five or 10. And so as I said, that the problem is if you're a farmer and you work on mouse because you have your favorite model of mouse Alzheimer or, or whatever else, and then you, you, you know, you, and you, you find this uh, gene and you target the protein and you develop a, you know, a drug against it, well, in the human, it doesn't turn out to be expressed at all, this particular one. So you really have to look at you know, populations of marker genes. So typ we typically find that we need, we need to keep track of 50 or 70 or 80 different populations of, um, of marker genes to identify these cell types. So that's why it's really important, as we now know, of course, to do your study. Ultimately, you have to do it on human tissue or on species that are much closer to the human than the mouse, like, like, um, like uh, monkey. But the basic principle is that human and mouse, their brains is rather remarkable similar. All right, so then we, we do this second. So this is mainly on, post, uh, on postmortem tissue with some neurosurgical tissue. So the neurosurgical tissue is, in our case, we have uh, seven or growing a net of, of clinical collaborators that we work with. It takes a lot of time and attention and resources, both on the neurosurgical clinical side as well as on our side, to make this work. So as I said, you know, you might have a temporal epileptic uh, 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 seizure here or a tumor, and so the surgeon has to access this and cut through a tunnel to get at that underlying piece of tissue. Here you have it. Then we slice it, we dice it, we record from it. Um, everybody now at the institute uses this tissue, so it's a very precious resource, and we have to slice it up into increasingly smaller and smaller volumes because everybody wants to do it because it's so much more cooler to work on human tissue than a mouse tissue. And so one of the remarkable things that we discovered, you can record, so typically a mouse, you can record four hours if you do a slice, right? So if you take a mouse, you sacrifice it, you take out a brain slice, you put it in a ditch, you perfuse it, you can record for four hours or five hours, and then gradient starts running down. Action potential aren't as big anymore, they become broader, resting potential drifts up to zero. Schumann, we don't know why, probably because it's, it's, you know, it's evolved to survive much longer, it's more, um, um, it's more resistant to oxidative damage, and we can record two or three days uh, from the same slice. It's quite remarkable. So we get beautiful, this is now routine, here you can see the cell body, you can you know, inject current and you get you know, different excitatory cell, interneuron, you can inject biocytin. We do detailed computer modeling of all these cells, both single cells as network, so we're very interested in, in injecting them, reconstructing them, and then doing computer models to match the experiment against, uh, against the data. And this is now done pretty much in pipeline modes. So here, for instance, we've done a lot of comparison because um, A, we want to know how do these properties change uh, with time of recording. So this is roughly 72 hours would be here, three days. We're also interested in looking at, for example, where's the difference between tumor and epilepsy. Uh, epileptic cases because you always have to worry this is not normal tissue, it's, it's tissue that comes from people with pathology, so that's always a big worry, but by and large it's very stable. We don't find, uh, with one exception, don't find any difference between tumor 
in, um, in epileptic uh, uh, seizures. Yeah, you can find all sorts of really interesting stuff for, for the experts. I'm not going to go into that. This, uh, you know, where you find diff uh, sp very specific differences of, of specific expressed currents that you find in a human but not in a mouse and, and, and vice versa. Um, here's, yeah, so for example, this is one piece where we find all the, you know, where we rec manage to record all these different neurons. And then we can do reconstruction. Now you can see there are slices, so they're all thin. They're 350 microns. And of course, we can only get the axons. Here's the axons within the slides. We don't have access to the whole brain, of course, in the human surgical case to do the full brain reconstruction like we can do in, in human. But this is pretty cool. This is the stuff you used to think with. I mean, these are the neurons in your head. Well, you have, a few, you have 16 billion of them in your cortex. Um, Yeah, so then what we're doing, because we're not only, so right now the method du jour, as it were, is single cell transcriptomics, 10x and other companies, and it's very hard, and the technology keeps on evolve, evolving and becoming better, and people do use this technology because it lends itself to scale. So now with 10x and DropSeq, you can do 100,000 cells, and you can do, you know, people contemplating half a million or a million cells. You don't do as deep as smarter technology, uh, but, but, you know, you can make it up for, um, for the number. However, we, st we, d we have only a very dim understanding of the relationship between transcriptional cell types, the actual proteins that are later expressed, right, because that's really that, um, that matters, and how that relates to actually the function of the neurons, their morphology, and the electrical behavior. So what we are trying to do is to combine all three things, to understand the transcriptional, by transcriptional means we call these T-types, transcriptional defined types, we're trying to reconstruct the in slice the morphology and try to do classification using morphology, unsupervised classification, that's called M-types. And then we also, as I said, we inject current at the soma, it's a very biased view, it's at the soma in a slice, which is probably approximation to comatose brain, right? This is not, this is not how n neurons, I've recorded from neurons in the human brain with Isaac like Free. This is not how human neurons look in vivo, but that's how they look in, in, in slice, very similar to to, to neurons of, uh, of other animals. And then you can do, you know, you can have a lot of fun, uh, you know, clustering. I won't go into the details. Uh, so, you, and then again, you can do this model. Here we use a genetic algorithm where, uh, you know, we use this morphology. This is the target signature uh, of the spike and of the response of the cell to a, a step spike. And what took me for my PhD sort of three years to model, I had to handwrite my program in Pascal that most of you probably don't even know what it is um, anymore. Now you, you know, use Python, you go on the cloud and use genetic algorithm and, you know, whiz bang, and you get these automatic classification of, uh, automatic modeling of cells, right, where now, you can, go, you can go in and you can just download from our web, website the, the, the files in Hoc language that you can use to model these cells and all the electrophysiology, including active dendrites. We're doing that with the, uh, human, uh, the Blue Brain Project in, in Geneva. Uh, because as I said, we're interested simultaneously also modeling you know, large networks of these, um, of these cells. And so the question posed, so here we have reconstructed the electrical behavior and the morphology of a layer three biapical parental cell. So what we see, not infrequently, what we almost never seen in mouse, by the way, are cells that have two apical dendrites. It's very interesting. This is a layer three basket cell, inhibitory cell, and this is what we think of a Martinotti cell. But of course, we dearly like to know, well, how do these uh, ME type, these morpho-electrical type, relate to their transcriptional types? And so there, um, we took this uh, technique called PatchSeq, and we made it very uh, uh, robust and rugged, and we've now done this in 2,000 cases. Well, what we do in a slice, we go in, we record from the cell, we have a brief protocol to electrically distinguish it, we inject biocytin to be able to later on reconstruct it, and then we suck out the, uh, the RNA. So typically, we try to get the nucleus, because that's the most reliable signature, but otherwise, we get the, um, just the RNA from the from the, out of the soma, and we do transcriptional analysis. And then, so then we have, at the single cell level, now in 2,000 neurons, the combined morphology, electrical behavior, and transcriptional behavior. And we're currently analyzing the data. Uh, I can't show you, we, we don't have really complete data to, and, um, and to show yet. 
And then at the same time, uh, what we're doing, we're applying the, the, the power of molecular genetics that's really developed in the, in, you know, in the fly, in, in, the, in, the, in the mouse, to try to apply to humans. Why would we want to do that? Well, we want to be able to say, for instance, we're interested in PT cells, in the primal tract neurons that go from layer 5 and motor cortex down the spinal cord. Why would we care about them? Well, for instance, in ALS, because in ALS, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, lateral sclerosis, those are the neurons that are specifically affected. Now, they exist only in 0.5% of all the cells down there, so it's very, very difficult by chance to get them. But we got a promoter from the, uh, as shown uh, uh, here. We have a promoter of these cells in mouse yeah, using a particular technology called Enhancer. We can adapt it so we see these same cells in, mo in monkey, and then we see the same cells in human. So these are now PT, these are layer 5 primal tract neurons that sit in layer 5 that are very big and specifically go down to the, to the brain stem and down into the, into the spinal cord. Interestingly, what happens, one of these changes in evolution, there are lots of these cells in the mouse, but proportionally they're vastly fewer in the human because in human what's really expanded are cortical-cortical interactions. The cortical-cortical neurons, so-called IT neurons, have expanded much more than pyramidal tract interneurons. They have expanded, but relatively more modestly so in, uh, in, a, in a human. And then we can also now do staining, where we stain so we have this technique, because we're very interested in looking at the synaptic interaction, because ultimately, just like people, we're not isolated, right? As you can see, Facebook and social media, we're partly defined of who we talk to. And so the same thing, neurons are partly defined who they talk to, so we have this this roboticist platform where we can stick, you know, up to eight electrodes. They themselves find, they're in a robotic control, they find their own neurons. They, they, they suck onto, they glom onto individual neurons and penetrate them. And then the, you can do stable recordings. You can inject current. So now you can see, uh, is there synaptic connectivity? And we can do that in a mouse, but we can also, this is in human tissue. And because we've got viral technique, for example, we can make the, all the GABAergic cell, we can make them turn red or green. Right, so we can, we can now preferentially record from, in the human from GABAergic cells or from excitatory cells or from uh, layer 5 pyramidal tract neurons. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so th this is what we want to do. I mean, we're, of course, inspired, like most people, by the periodic table, but we have no, no illusion that uh, in these highly evolved systems, um, it's not going to be anywhere that clean. In fact, we're now uh, more interested um, to try to understand, I guess in chemistry, what we call nucleosynthesis, to try to understand the developmental origin of these cell types and to try to track them back early on in the onset of the organism to see how from a single cell the, the organism goes into having an organ that probably in total has on the order of 2,000 cell types. That's sort of my current best estimate that the, something like the human brain will have on the order of 2,000 cell types, and the entire body may have on the order of 5,000 or so cell types. And of course, then there's also the difficult question that remains unresolved in the field. What's the difference between a cell type and a cell state? Right? So for example, when you go to sleep, the brain enters a different state, or when you go into REM sleep from non-REM sleep. We know in mice, for example, mice, male mice that had a single uh, sexual experience, some neurons in the ventral lateral hypothalamus, uh, change their permanently their cell type. So uh, there's all these complexities that we are only beginning to, to scratch the, the, um, and the, surf, uh, the surface of. All right, so that's, the, uh, that's what we're doing up in, um, up in, um, in Seattle. So once again, we are, we are this, uh, this large uh, team-based organization. Um, the, well, what's really unique about us, at, at least so far, everything we've done, we, we freely share with the, and openly share with the community. We have these uh, great industry tools. In fact, if I ever go back to, uh, to academia, I would certainly, I think some of those would also be very useful to instituted universities, like deadlines. <laughs> Shock, <laughs> gasp, and actually hold people to deadlines. Uh, these plans, of course, also come with unique challenges. Industry knows this. 
For us, these challenges are closer to the challenges that the physics community has experienced in, in large-scale physics projects, for example, in the Large Hadron Collider at SLAC here at Stanford or uh, LHC or, or the, the LIGO project when you have many very gifted people working together towards a common goal, but then you also have people, you know, they have their own drives, motivation, and there are only so many first authors and, you know, all those sort of aspects of team science that you have to do, th do this. So partly we think of the, I think of this as an experiment in the, in the sociology of, um, of um, neuroscience. This is really only possible thanks to the generosity and wisdom of one individual. This is, uh, this is our team, our scientists and engineers, and it's thanks to this individual that it's all made possible. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? No, we have, we have not, so we take right now, it's a, we're cortical chauvinist, for better words, we focus on cortex. We have thought of starting, we may well do this in the future, start an entire large scale effort that's primarily focused on pain and addiction, uh, that, would, that would look, of course, heavily in the, in the brain stem to exactly address the interaction between the reward mechanism and the pain mechanism and things like opioids. And, and, and other pain medication and how it changes permanently um, the, the, sta the state of individuals and then the behavior of uh, the individuals who seek pleasure. So, but we haven't done it here yet. Yeah, no, so once again, so far it's been a basic neuroscience program. We try to look for neurotypical brains that are, as far as we can tell, you know, died from cardiac event or something like that. But we're now getting ready um, as we are currently, um, so we have this 10-year uh, program that I instituted when I came in 2000, uh, 2011. So it's, it's uh, going to end by April 1, 2022. And so we're now thinking what should we do next, this big project, and then try to recruit leaders uh, for that effort. And there we're thinking should we focus on the hypothesis that you want to look at, for example, one particular form of Alzheimer or frontal pen, uh, temporal dementia or Lewy body disease or maybe a monogenetic variant of that or monogenetic variant of schizophrenia and very specifically address the question, is that, is that particular pathology defined as, as narrowly as possible? Is that due to a specific deficit in cell type? Then track down that deficit in cell type and then develop uh, th therapies against it. Now, we know in some cases like ALS or like Dravet syndrome and epileptic seizure, it seems to be something very, very specific. So the question is, should we focus on one of those first, try to understand the mechanism, uh, really at the, circuit, at the cell type, try to look at circuits, but now through the picture of cell type, right? Because we view now, or modern neuroscience, everything is, is seen through the picture of cell types. It is not just a collection of a billion neurons, but a collection of, of you know, a billion neurons of 100 different cell types all interacting in very specific, um, in very specific way. But that's, uh, that's what we, something what we want to do, which is why we're look, beginning to look now for partners, but we haven't, uh, we haven't gone down that road yet. So, they, so Paul had many, many interests. There are, in fact, there are, there are multiple Allen Institutes. There's one for cell science, for immunology. There's us, we are sort of the biggest. And then, as you mentioned, it's the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. They have different goals. They're trying to understand what it means to understand, not using machine learning, but using other, uh, other tools. So we have one project that relates to mining of literature. But otherwise, at this point, we are not, they, they have their own uh, big project that they're pursuing. All right, thank you very much.